Well, I bet some of you are still wondering, what is a discussion about disease doing in a conference about ideas and innovation? But I work for, an all tech, for all tech, which is also a Kentucky company, which has looks through animal nutrition and animal health, as well as human health and nutrition, through a very different lens. And that's good, because disease pathogens these days are extremely innovative, and they have a lot of ideas. So what I want to do is briefly paint you a picture of what the infectious disease situation is for us today, and then maybe leave you with a different perspective on what that is and what it has been and what it will be. Now, 50 years ago, public health officials would be amazed to think that in 2014 we'd be talking about infectious disease. The reason for that is that they thought 50 years ago that they were looking at the end of that continual cycle of epidemics and pandemics. They actually thought that was over. In fact, in 1967, the U.S. Attorney General, the Surgeon General, made this statement that the war against infectious diseases has been won. Now, we smile to think of that now, well, smile or sigh, because we've seen 30 and 40 years of the AIDS epidemic. We've seen SARS, which he mentioned, and I will again, and all kinds of infectious diseases. They're on our news all the time, we think about them. But you, in 1967, Dr. William Stewart, he had a pretty good reason for being very optimistic. He could look back on 100 years of an incredible improvements in sanitation, in vaccination, in vector control, mosquitoes, and so forth that carry disease. And then finally, in the late 1930s, the advent of antibiotics. In 1950, uh, or in 1967, when he made that statement about infectious diseases, antibiotics had only been in routine use in human medicine for about 17 years, only since about 1950. So they thought, public health officials then thought they had the world by the tail, and for good reason. They had gone from 100 years before that time, there wasn't even a germ theory of disease. If those of you in science classes or those of you who remember the science classes you, you took, remember that Dr. Robert Snow closed the cholera epidemic in 1853 or 4 in London by shutting off the Broad Street pump. Now, that probably didn't happen that dramatically, but I hope it did. It's a great science story. All the way into the advent of antibiotics. Dr. Stewart, who, I mean, you don't get the Surgeon's General job right out of college, do you? So he was probably born, I think he was born in 1921. He, he could look back on his own life and his own family history to an incredible difference in infant mortality between 1900, which infant mortality was extremely high, 100, and if you took that to the under 15, to the age of 15, almost 20% of children died around 1900 to some sort of childhood disease, whooping cough, Scarlet fever, there were quite a number of them, diphtheria. But in 1950, that had been reduced quite a bit. At the same time, life expectancy had grown a tremendous amount. It's around 50 years at the turn of that century. But by the middle of that century, it had gone to about 70 years. So they looked out on a pretty prosperous world. But almost as soon as the words left Dr. Stewart's mouth, he had, we knew he spoke too soon. Every year since the 1960s, infectious dis diseases have been on the rise globally. And it's both developed countries and undeveloped countries. Everywhere, there's been an increase in infectious disease. It's two kinds of diseases. There are both emerging diseases and what we call re-emerging diseases. Emerging diseases are those which are newly identified. HIV, for example, would be a, a, an emerging disease. Avian influenza was an emerging disease. The others are re-emerging diseases. So those are old diseases, things that we've known about for years that reappear in a new form, maybe antibiotic resistant, or in a new place. Examples of that are cholera, malaria, and tuberculosis, certainly. Now why? What's happening here? Why did all this happen with the incredible medical talent and scientific abilities we have today, why 
are all these diseases around us? Where do they come from? Uh, we begin to understand that when you realize that it takes more than just a microbe to cause a disease in the same way that it takes more than a criminal to cause a crime. It takes an interaction of the pathogen and its host and the environment in which they coexist to shape the character of what sort of a disease emerges. I mean, will just one person be infected? Will there be an epidemic in a region or in a country or a pandemic? But when we look at disease pathogens today, there are two things that they have in common. And one is that they are zoonotic and that they tend to be viruses. Now, how many of you know what a zoonotic disease is? Zoonotic diseases are those that we contract from animals. Now, that's nothing new or odd. When, if you look at our a group of pathogens, about 61% of all human pathogens are zoonotic, or at some point in history, they came from animals. However, when we look at the emerging diseases, the new things that we're seeing today, three quarters of those were contracting for animals. The other point is that they tend to be viruses. In fact, if you, on the left here, if you look at all infectious diseases in humans, you see that most of our friends there are bacteria. Not that many are viruses, only 15%. But when you look over at emerging diseases, at the new diseases, the ones that we are most likely to contract today, 44% of them are viruses. In fact, they put bacteria in the shade with fungi and worms and protozoa just pretty much on drums and high harmonies. And what are these kinds of viruses? They are, tend to be RNA viruses. Those are viruses that have RNA instead of DNA as their genetic material. If you look at the list of RNA viruses, you're going to see some familiar names from the news in the past few years, whether it be yellow fever reoccurring, rotavirus, the Ebola virus, HIV certainly, or avian influ influenza. There's a lot of them and more all the time. Well, why? Why are we getting diseases from animals these days? Why are they viruses? And why now? Why now is this happening? Well, the part of the plot, which are, is zoonotic, is actually not new news. In fact, it is, is as old as mankind. We've been contracting diseases from animals since the day one. Some of them are so old, down here at the bottom, they're described as heirloom diseases. They are, um, there are certain viruses or retroviruses that are actually become endogenous. They're part of our genetic material. Some at the top are ongoing. Those are the newly emerging diseases, something like an, the, uh, the uh, avian influenza, certainly, or SARS. And then quite a few have adapted. In other words, we originally got them from an animal, but then we, we caught them, we contracted them, we modified them, and then are able to pass them from human to human without any more help from the animal world. So this is old news. Very much old news. In fact, I'm going to, I'll borrow the painting, Edward Hicks' beautiful painting of the Ark, to show you who you've got to thank from our, of our four-legged friends for some of our more common diseases. Wild ruminants, cattle come in for quite a few of those because, of course, they've been a food source, either hunted or domesticated for a very long time. Anthrax, measles, diphtheria, rhinoviruses, about the common cold, were originally contracted from wild ruminants. Sheep, peptic ulcers, whooping cough developed from pigs. Glanders is a disease in horses that our great-grandparents worried more about than we do anymore since we don't use horses routinely. Goats get the rap for tuberculosis, although sheep sometimes are blamed for that as well. All of these diseases originally developed from animals. So the question isn't why are zoonotic diseases emerging? The question is, what's changing about our relationship with animals? And the answer to that is we have. We have changed incredibly. Our population has exploded. In between 1900 and 2000, we're, those of us born within that time frame are part of the most incredible demographic event in human history. And that was a fourfold increase in the population. Around the turn of the century, the, the last century, there was only 1.6 billion people. All at once in 2000, 
Other changes here from 1800 to 1900, not that big. In 1700 and 1600, 500 million, 650 million, things like this. And this is due to change again. It's projected by the year 2050 that there will be over 9 billion people on this planet. Those of you that are born after the turn of the century will be contributing to that, be a part of that demographic, demographic event. And we're well on track for it. Our, the world population, I believe, is 7.1 or 2 billion right now. So we are following those predictions pretty well. Can you imagine what a pinch this puts on the food chain? How many people it ha we have to feed to make that happen, to make sure that we are healthy? Well, with this human population explosion also comes a livestock population explosion because it takes a lot of meat, milk, and eggs to feed all of us, and it will take a lot more to feed 9 billion, certainly. Also, we have an incredible overlap, and this collision of wildlife and human habitat is this contact point is one of the reasons we see disease jumping from species to other species to humans through one route or another. Basically, this boils down to the fact that this has become an extremely clouded planet. Our population has exploded and is continuing to increase. Ecologies collide. And then you put that together with our incredible propensity for travel, trade, and migration. Our world becomes increasingly interconnected. And when you do that, you basically create the perfect storm for zoonotic disease emergence. Pleasant, it, pleasant, isn't it? But we have the population density on the human side to carry almost any disease from person to person or community to community. We've got human and wildlife ecologies in contact, so we have that contact between that will allow that mean uh, motive operation to, to cross species. And then we have our propensity for travel. We translocate diseases ourselves. So we have kind of a perfect storm. SARS is a, actually a great example of this. How many of you remember the SARS? It was a severe acute respiratory syndrome that appeared in 2003 in southern China. This one happened fast. It had a very high death rate for the infections. 8,000 people were affected. And almost 900 of them died, which is a pretty high kill ratio for a disease. It was initially noticed that it was the people contracted this disease from civet cats, which were sold in southern live markets in, in China. Now that disease originally was contracted from fruit bats that flew around the lights in those types of markets. The cats contracted it from the bats. People contracted it from the cats. It was the disease that Jack built. But what scared us was this. One Chinese doctor who treated an undiagnosed SARS patient checked into the Metropole Hotel in Hong Kong. 24 hours later, 12 people had SARS. And Hong Kong being the commuter place that it is, they all went home. They took that disease back with them such that in within weeks, that disease was in 37 countries. Amazing. Well, we focus primarily on these RNA viruses because they replicate so quickly. They replicate very fast. Unlike uh, other types of viruses, they're missing a kind of spell check for replication that corrects errors. So a swarm of species cre are created when they replicate. The chance, the worry there is that one of those species will be more likely or more able, more suited to transmission to us and from you to me. Making that species jump is what zoonotic diseases are about. And of course, the one that's the most familiar to us in the species jump is when the simian immunodeficiency virus jumped species became, we adapted it, and it became the human immunodeficiency disease that causes AIDS. Now, mentioned the correlation with the criminal and the crime and needing opportunity, means motive and opportunity, the way that that disease is thought to have crossed was the bushmeat trade in Western Africa, probably in the 1950s or 60s. Now, 
the slaughter and preparation of game for human consumption is still going on today, it goes on everywhere. And there are lots of retroviruses, not very different from the SIV or HIV, that are still out there. It happens on a continual basis. But don't think that just because Africa's got a greater biological diversity that that's just something that happens there. It happens in other kinds of situations as well. It's all bushmeat. How many of you that went deer hunting last year put on nitrile or latex gloves before they field dressed a deer or put on those same kind of gloves before they filleted a fish? We don't, do we? We just don't. But it's all bushmeat in the end. Our other animal people contract that we worry about greatly is our livestock populations. And this is true all over the planet. We worry about livestock becoming a mixing uh, vessel, essentially, to amplify diseases because they are in contact with wildlife and very in close contact with humans. We worry that those diseases, those RNA viruses, will mix, reassort themselves, and result in something that will transfer very quickly and something that would be very contagious for you and I. So I haven't really painted you a very good picture, have I? This, in 2014, is our infectious disease situation that we, that we look at. But it's not 1910. It's not that grim a picture at all. Our medical report, we, resources are incredible. Our public health responses to disease these days are incredible. The SARS epidemic, that was a fast virus and very amenable to control by quarantine, and that happened. That was able to happen very quickly. And we're on our guard because we know that it's out there disease these days. So that's pretty different from 1910. So although this type of this presentation, the conclusion is pretty much rights itself, we have a perfect storm. And then that perfect storm, due to our travel trade migration and the fact that we're continuing to crowd the planet, isn't likely to abate very soon. But what I'd like to leave you with is a look back on perspective, get some perspective on disease. We're talking about this is what we see now, but think about how that's changed over time and where you fit into it. These are the generational cohort groupings that demographers put us into. We get familiar with this kind of cohort grouping. Um, first of us, the baby boomers, for example. We're familiar with that with Generation X, new boomers. We talk about those historically defined groups of people. This is all of those which were alive during the 20th century. Starting from about 1780, the new worlders that came, the hard timers, those that had the, the fought World War I, were rewarded with the Depression, and then finished their working lives in the World War II economy. Look at how the disease picture has changed for folks over time. These people, the New Worlders, the hard timers, 20% of those children died before the age of 15. An amazing difference, an unthinkable one for us. Think about how the good warriors, that would be the population that, that fought World War II, came home from World War II, filled up the trade unions, and also, the lucky few, those born between the wars or after the Depression and during World War II, look at the difference in disease. Our grandparents worried horribly that we might contract polio. So those, the good warrior group, the lucky few, raised children, raised the baby boomers, that, and they worried very much until the 1950s when the country really got together and got everyone vaccinated against polio. It's an incredible movement. There are some incredible wins when we look back at the control of disease in the country and in the world over time. And it's a good perspective to have. Because as our human environment changes, so do those pathogens and the diseases that we get. So thank you very much.